In August 1992, the sleepy town of Bargo near Sydney becomes the scene of the most horrendous crime. She was so beautiful, I just knew somebody had taken her. I can't believe that another human being would do that to a little girl or any child. Nine-year-old Ebony Simpson has vanished without a trace whilst walking home from school. There's no reason for her not to have come home. We can only assume that something's happened. It's everybody's nightmare, um, a parent's nightmare, their child being abducted. Even if you're out there, darling, and if you can get home, get home or give us a ring. It's pretty much the worst case scenario. The fate of the schoolgirl will unfold in the most shocking way. He knew where she was all the time. He joined the search party. All that time we were looking for Ebony and the killer's car is a few yards away. I hadn't heard something as callous as being on the search party to cover your tracks. It just it disgusts me 20 years later. The abduction of Ebony Simpson was so horrific, it rocks the foundations of a close-knit community and is a crime that shook Australia. On the afternoon of Wednesday the 19th of August, 1992, pretty Ebony Simpson disappeared on her way home from school. She went to school, she didn't come home. And uh, she got off the school bus. And, um, you know, she had to walk a couple hundred yards just up the road. And uh, she just didn't come home. The tragedy that was to unfold would rip through the heart of a family who had moved to the small town of Bargo many years before to start a new life. We'd bought an old farmhouse and done that up. We'd been there about 14 years. We'd chosen to live in the country, and the boys at a country school, and then uh, Ebony came along. So it, it was an ideal life for children and, uh, and us. With two young boys, Christine and her husband, Peter, completed their family with the arrival of their daughter, Ebony Jane, in 1983. I remember when I had Ebony, I, I had two boys and then I had Ebony and I just couldn't believe I got this beautiful little girl. Yeah, she was pretty special. She was soft, kind, and we were very close. She was just lovely. Warm. It was just really nice, you know, um, a nice way to live. And we moved to the country so that the kids would have a better life, and um, then this happened to us. The Simpsons built their new life on their farm until everything changed in August 1992. Ebony had had a talk at school with the police the day before about stranger danger. She came home and told me. I said to her, if anything ever comes up, you know, in your life, anything happens, you have to come home and tell me, you know. Then, you know, I read her a story, she went to bed. And the next day when she went to school, she didn't come home. The usual school routine meant Christine met Ebony at the bus stop, just metres away from their house, at the end of the day. Normally I was always home and I was always there. And um, we were getting insurance and I was a bit late and I said to one of my sons, you know, just, just go down and meet the bus for Ebony. I'll be a little bit late, but I won't be far away. Ebony's school was only five kilometres away from the Simpson home. Her bus journey took 10 minutes and the walk from the bus stop up to the Simpson farm was just one kilometre away. But this last-minute change of plan brought a strange twist of fate. His bus was late and he thought she was at home and then I came home and 
and as soon as I pulled up at the house, I knew that um, there was no shoes there. Ebony's shoes weren't at the front door. My husband at the time, Peter, notified the police, rang them, and I went down to the bus stop. And then I went along the road and I ran through the creek and I went in the house next door looking for her, thinking maybe she got scared or something, you know. But she was a very responsible young girl, you know. She was nine, nearly ten at the time. I drove out to the Simpsons' home where I met with uh, a bunch of other police that were waiting there for me. Local officers quickly began an action plan to search for the schoolgirl. The first information I was given was that Ebony had um, caught the school bus from Bargo School and she was seen to actually get off the bus at the corner of Arena Road and Bargo Road and started walking towards her house. Rod Grant now had a possible sighting, but Ebony's movements were still sketchy. As the search for her got underway, further news came in. An older man um, come up to the command post. He'd heard that there was something wrong and there were a lot of police cars, so he'd come up to ask what was happening. And he told the general duties police that his two sons had seen Ebony walking home and just before she got around the corner just near her house, there was another a small yellow car with a man with the bonnet up. And the boys waved to her, to Ebony, and she waved back to them and they, and they continued driving home. This new information placed somebody else in the vicinity, but police needed more. Then I went inside and I spoke to Peter and Christine Simpson, um, got some background information about Ebony, her normal behaviours, pretty much wanted to find out, you know, is this out of the norm? And straight away, you could tell it was completely out of the norm. Yeah, because um, she was a very reliable young girl, um, come from a good family background, no dramas at all. And further news is to heighten the growing sense of panic. Once she got to that car, she didn't make it past that point, because there's a couple more houses between her home and where this car was. And so we had a confirmed sighting that she was at that site, so she didn't make it past there. And so then the alarm bells are ringing. Nine-year-old Ebony Simpson has gone missing on her way home from school. A delay with her brother's bus meant that he didn't get back in time to meet her. Ebony's house is only a kilometre away from the bus stop, but in that short distance, she has vanished. And now to add to the rising panic, neighbours report seeing her walking towards a stranger's car, but there has been no sign of her since. I don't know when you let a child get off a school bus. We'd lived there for 14 years. People said, oh, I'll let her get off the bus. All kids should be allowed to do that and just walk around up the corner and home. It's a part of growing up, but, you know, obviously I'm wrong. Ebony has now been missing for hours. With her family frantic with worry, this news of a sighting of her and a car spotted on her route home, officers were now in a race against time to discover where the little girl could have gone. At that time, there's two tasks, and we had to separate that pretty early on. There's a search for Ebony, and there's also a criminal investigation, both taking place at the same time. So the search was set up as a grid pattern for several kilometres around where she was last seen. Homes and paddocks, dams, you know, bush. By now, darkness has fallen. News of Ebony's disappearance is spreading through the community and beyond. There's no reason for her not to have come home. You can only assume that something's happened. As officers ramp up their search, they call on members of the public to help their plight. 
can still remember what's going through my mind. The priority is just to find her and find her alive. The whole town was volunteering to come and help. Everybody who, who um, was anybody, pretty much, was just was out there looking, searching. So that had to be coordinated because you couldn't just have people rush running around everywhere. Police are looking for her, everybody's searching for her. I mean, helicopters were flying above, you know, with sensor lights on them. As the minutes turn into agonising hours for the Simpsons, buildings and acres of bushland are scoured for any clues. I think you, you make anything up in your head that gets you through that time, but I don't think we slept. We just stood there waiting for some sort of answer. And they said, oh, she would have gone to someone else's place to play, but she wouldn't do that. She wasn't like that, you know what I mean? By the following morning, Christine and her family are desperate for news. As more people offer to help with the search, Rod Grant tries to uncover anything unusual during the last few weeks. I'd spoken with Christine back at the house and I said, had she seen anything suspicious? And at first she said, no, she hadn't seen anything, anybody suspicious hanging around. And then I remembered, oh, maybe I should rephrase the question. Have you, what have you seen? Have you seen any cars that don't, or people that don't fit the area? And then she said, well, matter of fact, I saw a, a man parked down near the bus stop um, in a yellow, um, in a small yellow car. She said, I think it was a, a Datsun 120Y. This was now the second description given to Rod of a yellow car seen in the area. Christine told me she actually saw that car twice. And from the canvas that we did with neighbours as well, that night and the following days, they said that they'd seen a car hanging around for a few weeks, this little yellow car. I thought he was just some young guy and, you know, his car had broken down and I went down to get Ebony off the bus and went past him and I remember looking at him and thinking, I'll pick Ebony up and I'll come back around and I'll see if I can help you. This vehicle is now becoming a major focus. Rod is desperate to see if Christine's account of this car is similar to the one seen by the two boys who waved at Ebony just moments before she vanished. I pulled up my notebook and I started talking to um, one of the boys who was 13 and his brother was 17. And they started straight away telling me what they'd seen. It was a Mazda 808. The bonnet was up. The man was leaning into the engine bay with something black in his hand. The car's fairly dirty. There's mud splashed up on the near side. And then he said, there's patch up work on it as well and you can see where somebody has painted. He said, um, it's called yellow ochre. And he told me the name of the colour. And I thought, oh my God, this is so much detail. As a clearer picture is emerging on this vehicle last seen near Ebony, other officers work with her family as the search is scaled up. Detective Sergeant Cole Pateman and Detective Sergeant Steve Foster they went out to the Simpson household and sat out there with the Simpsons and they got a, you know, pretty much a really, really detailed background about you know, what Ebony was wearing that day, what she had in her backpack, what she had for lunch, all those sorts of details, all the background of the family, is there any problems? The police command post set up outside the Simpson home has by now become a focal point for concerned residents, extra officers and the country's media, all desperate to help. Everybody was given an area to search uh, in their groups. It was the police, SES, rural fire service and just volunteers from the community. So they all had areas that they had to go and search. There's a sense of urgency there. People running around and locals um, walking up to police, how can I get involved, how can I help? Uh, people arriving all the time, uh, various specialist units arriving police-wise. Um, a real big build-up right outside the family home. A couple of police that were coming from Campbelltown arrived late to the briefing, they missed the briefing. And a sergeant there, he said, he told them, they said, well, what's the go, what are we, what are we looking for? And they said, well, they described Ebony. And we're also looking for a, a yellow Mazda 808. 
and one of the guys said to the sergeant, he said, like, it, like that car over there, and the sergeant turned and looked at the car which was parked at the command post, just not even 50 metres away. He said, if that's a Mazda 808, that's the type of car we're looking for. So, <laughs> alarm bell started ringing again. Astonishingly, this similar car was just yards away. But crucially, the officers cannot jump to conclusions. As they hone in on the vehicle, Christine is asked to describe the man she has seen in the days before. My role at this stage was to do a, what they call a photo fit or a penry ID, um, based on information that Christine Simpson could uh, provide me with. As you can imagine, she was going through a, a large amount of emotions at that time, so I had to be very careful with what I did and what I said to Christine. But in the end, she provided me with a, a brilliant description and a, a fantastic photo fit that would progress the investigation uh, considerably. What happens next is to be the biggest turning point in the hunt for Ebony so far. We couldn't do anything more with what we had, uh, with what she provided me. I walked outside and as I was walking up to the front gate of the property, I, uh, my boss came down and I just said, well, this is what uh, Christine Simpson's given me. And he just, he took a step back and he said, oh, that's the bloke we were just talking to. Wayne had put this picture together at the house. At the same time, the guys realised that we'd better watch this car and see who comes back to it. They're doing checks on who it belongs to. One of the policemen came back down to our farm and they said, I think the guy's out the front. And they said to me, we want you to come and have a look at the car. And I went up to the front, out the front of our farm, and I had a look at the car and I said, well, it's, it's similar, but I don't know, it's just a yellow car, you know. But the one thing was that when I saw him three days before losing Ebony, he was looking into the motor of the car and it was stopped on the side of the road and it was a, it was a Mazda 808 and the bonnet opened the other way. And I remembered that and that's what that car was. The car has a striking resemblance to the yellow vehicle seen in the area. And the photo fit picture police have compiled from Christine's recollection now looks very similar to the description given by the boys Rod has interviewed. But officers know nothing more. Time is running out, and they have to act fast. he came back to the car, so they started asking him a couple of questions about the car, where he, his movements and all that sort of stuff. Then uh, they called Wayne out to take some photos of the car, and he just put this picture together with Christine. Police waste no time questioning the man about his car. He was really compliant, actually. He, was, he wasn't evasive in any ways, really. He was fairly quiet. John Rain's first priority was, can you open the boot? Cause, and he did, because he thought, well, is Ebony still in the boot if, if this is the car? Uh, he was really compliant. He was really calm. Um, so he it didn't really raise suspicions. Like, he wasn't evasive and he wasn't you know, try and avoid helping. Nothing looks immediately suspicious in the boot, but officers know it is essential to get the vehicle to the station for further tests. I think they said at that stage, if we want to use it to take some photographs to put in the media for the, for the news that night, to put this is the type of car that we're looking for, for the media. That was some, it wasn't a ploy, but it was a real thing that we were gonna do anyway, just in case, you know, because we didn't want to put all the eggs in one basket. Measures are quickly taken to tow the car to a secure police garage, where forensic searches get underway. My role with the vehicle was to go over it with a fine tooth comb and try and identify any physical evidence that may either put Ebony in that car. It might have been biological evidence, it might have been clothing, it could have been school books, anything. I was looking for anything. As Wayne Day scrutinises the vehicle for any clues, the owner is eager to help with inquiries and agrees to go to the station to answer any questions. They go inside into the detective's office and 
say, what are we going to do? And asking each other, or as I call it, the hard questions. Do we just go and put it straight on him? Where is she? Because we've still got a missing girl. The criminal investigation at that stage was second priority. The first priority was finding her alive, so. And he was so cool and, and calm that they had to second guess themselves and think, maybe he isn't involved, so we'll just treat him like you know, a witness about his car, asking where he's been. Time is now of the essence. The team need answers. But they are still unsure if this man had anything to do with Ebony's disappearance. As questioning gets underway, they learn more about this local, now identified as Andrew Garforth. Andrew Peter Garforth, born 5863. He'd only been in the area a few months. He and his wife had moved to the area. Prior to that, he came from Western Australia. So there really weren't any alarm bells, uh, alarm bells about this guy living in the community or being a threat to kids in the area. Just totally out of the blue, as far as everyone was concerned. And he was married with two children. And, you know, lived up the road and hadn't been in trouble locally, as far as we know. With little information on this 29-year-old, the detectives are eager to find out if Garforth has anything to do with Ebony's disappearance. He just starts asking him questions about what his movements were. Went to the hardware shop, bought two bolts. He gave an account, pretty much that he'd been to the video store at Tarmor. What time was it when you left to go to Bargo to the video store? Yeah, quarter to four. In his account, he avoided saying that he went along Bargo Road and Arena Road. I drove down Pheasant's Nest Road Turn left onto Nightingale. Because that was the most that would have been the most direct route that he would have taken if he was going into Bargo to return a video or to go to the shop. So after a few more questions, Detective Pateman was just thinking what next to ask him pretty much. And then he goes over the version again. Can you just give me that again? And then he gives a whole different route that he took. And left onto Arena. Right onto Bargo. Arena Road is the last place Ebony was seen. Garforth's change in his account immediately raises their suspicion. I'm pretty sure he realised that his movements could be checked about the times because, one, we could have spoken to his wife what time he left, the people at the shop, the video shop. How long does it take you to drive from your home at Pheasant's Nest to the video store at Fargo? Roughly 10 minutes. Officers have only been questioning Garforth for 15 minutes. Nobody could have expected the next words he was to utter. And when the young girl was walking past the car, we the group. Over 300 people have now come together in the search for missing schoolgirl, Ebony Simpson. There's nowhere else I can really look because I've searched all the houses around here, most of their properties and that. She'd only get into a car with someone she'd know. A yellow car on the police radar has been parked just yards away from the command post for most of the search. Officers waste no time in questioning the owner. Went to the hardware shop, bought two bolts. And could never have imagined what is to unfold. He starts with... I drove along Bargo Road, I turned onto Arena Road, I stopped to put oil in my car. I had the bottom of the car up, I had the boot of the car open. I was putting oil in the car when the girl walked past. And when the young girl was walking past the car, I was to bring the boot. The detectives are led to believe Ebony never made it beyond the vehicle. I drove away. And where did you drive to? Down Arena. Now Garforth is calmly reaffirming their worst fears. And what did she say to you? She asked me if I was going to let her go, and I said I didn't know. With this horrifying admission, they are one step closer to uncovering her fate 
and are now desperate to discover her whereabouts. He um, drove Ebony to a, a bush track down, down not far away. He um, went to the back of his car, got some speaker wire, and he tied her hands behind her back and her feet behind her as well, and then tied her feet to her hands. And he just picked her up and threw her in the dam. I really don't know what my emotions were at that moment in time. I suppose um, my main concern is, well, we need to try and locate her in case she's still alive. That's, that's the, probably the most important thing at that stage. There was no mucking around. It's in the cars. Pack up, get to this location. It is now 11 p.m. Ebony has been missing for over 30 hours. The alert goes out to get to the scene of the crime as quickly as possible. With Garforth willing to show officers the location, they rush to just six kilometers from Ebony's home, praying they will find her alive. We walked up to the dam and I, it's something that sticks me forever and I get goosebumps talking about it is walking up over the top of the lip of the dam and seeing the pink lunchbox floating on the water and the water was like as still as still. No wind, no movement at all. It was just like glass. As soon as I saw that, I knew she was in there and we couldn't see her on the banks or anything like that and yeah, that was probably, it was disappointing. But mind you, with the temperatures in the area at that particular time, um, you know, she would probably wouldn't have survived anyway if she'd been into the water and then come out. She would have been, just the exposure probably would have killed her in any case. There was no chance that Ebony was still going to be alive because she, there was no sign of her in the, and she was still in the water, so they could tell that she was thrown, like, you know, eight to ten metres in. There's no way she could make it, and the way she was tied, no way she could make it to the bank. Ebony Simpson has died at the hands of her brutal attacker in what appears to be an utterly senseless crime. Andrew Garforth stood at the water's edge, describing his actions to police with no remorse whatsoever. Whilst the police and rescue teams have the painful task of recovering Ebony's body, officers are sent to Christine and her family to deliver the heartbreaking news. I think it was about two o'clock in the morning the police came and they'd sent two really young policemen up to tell us and they weren't equipped, you know. And I remember, I just remember falling onto the veranda saying, let me, I've got to hold her, let me hold her, you know. She might come back to life if I could hold her. They said, you can't do that. Nothing can prepare Ebony's family for the other news that is to follow. In the next interview, he went on that there was more. He actually said that he sexually assaulted Ebony. I took her up onto the bank of the dam, tied her hands and her feet, pulled her pants down and around her ankles, sexually assaulted her, picked her up and threw her in the dam. I couldn't clean my teeth. I couldn't get out of bed. If it wasn't for my two sisters coming and bringing food and feeding my other two children and telling me to get up and have a shower and do this, do that. I mean, I was a moron, I was a zombie. You know, I just um, sat and stared. Um, well, nothing means anything anymore. I mean, all the things about life, you know, that are so precious has just been ripped away from you. The sexual assault and murder of this defenceless little girl soon shook the whole country and provoked a fierce reaction. 
There was community outrage uh, very quickly from the moment uh, the matter was scheduled for court. There was a, a, a large gathering of, of locals were at the front of the court and everyone was wild, ropeable. Keep looking over your shoulder, buddy. <laughs> yelling abuse at that Garforth. Well, tie his arms and legs and see how he goes. Come on, get him here now. You know, you filthy so-and-so, you to die, you pig, and, you know, hang him and all this sort of stuff. It was a real lynch mob stuff. And, and I, really, I, you couldn't blame them. It was the community venting. Police waste no time charging Garforth with murder. After this initial appearance, the trial is set, whilst further evidence is gathered and Ebony laid to rest. The image that will stay with me for life, uh, apart from the, the facts of the story, but the, the image that will stay with me for life is seeing that little coffin. As adults, you, you go to funerals, you, you say goodbye to your loved ones, but this wasn't an adult coffin, it was a child's coffin, and it, that was someone saying goodbye to their, their child that uh, there's a little, little girl who, who was so brutally murdered and didn't deserve it, and, and the community was saying goodbye to her. For the Simpsons, their fight is only just beginning. With a trial to face, they are to never imagine the further pain they will endure. This man's raped and murdered my daughter. He's a pedophile. The legal system will step in and everything. No, it doesn't. I believed he'd just get locked up for life, but it's not like that. Um, when we were going to court Darlinghurst for the sentencing, they said he'd get 14 to 20 years. I said, not acceptable. I said, that's not acceptable. I said, you can bring back the death penalty, lock him up for the term of his natural life, or I'll get a hit man and blow him away. And, you know, I wasn't joking back then, and I'm still not joking today. Garforth's unspeakable actions are hard enough to bear, but additional news is to come to light about his movements after he had brutally murdered the little girl. Perpetrator, the man who'd done this to Ebony, had been up and joined the search party and walked all over our farm and he knew where she was all the time. Nine-year-old Ebony Simpson has suffered the most tragic death at the hands of a local paedophile. Missing for over 30 hours, the murderer has calmly admitted to abducting and sexually assaulting the schoolgirl before callously throwing her into a nearby dam. The details of her fate are almost too much to bear, but as her family tries to process the news, they are to endure even further heartache. They filmed the briefing taking place, and I still remember the footage of actually of um, Andrew Garforth standing smack bang in the middle of all the people. And there's, I don't know, probably 50 or 60 people standing there having their briefing about to move out to where they were going to search. He was just standing there, standing smack bang in the middle of it. He joined the search party. I mean, when I think of that today, it makes me nearly sick, you know? We were looking after the person who knew where she was and had already killed her. How callous can you be to murder a little girl like that and then pretend to search for her? Um, obviously, it's come out now, or suggested that his Garforth's wife um, you know, convinced him to join the search party, do the right thing, do the community thing, and, you know, he's masqueraded as a searcher for his own victim. That's just unbelievably callous. As Christine and her family have to consider life without Ebony, they spark a nationwide change in the way victims of crime are dealt with. We tried to get counselling and nobody wanted to take us on because it's, I guess, you're too hard. How are you going to counsel a family like us? What are you going to tell us? You know? Uh, 
you're going to tell us it's all right and we'll be OK and if we just do this, that and the other things will be fine. I got a phone call from, from Peter, uh, Ebony's father, and he was really very angry and he said words to the effect of, you know, everyone else is getting counselling here. Um, we haven't had a phone call from a counsellor. They really wanted something which, is, which they deserved, some decent support, professional support, help with their two boys, help with each other. You've got one person in that crazy system in there that just follows the book. You've got one person who stepped outside the boundaries, and that was John Merrick, you know, and uh, you don't get that very often. And I can't remember how the idea first crystallised, but it was something like these people might benefit from actually speaking to someone who's been through maybe a similar experience. And uh, there was an old bloke, uh, Gary Lynch, who was the father of uh, Anita Cobby, who was murdered some years prior. So he, in he introduced us to Anita Cobby's parents, Gary and Peg Lynch, and John and, and four other social workers from, from Glebe, Coroner's Court, and we got together. And that's how the Homicide Victim Support Group was started. The Homicide Victim Support Group was formed by Christine, John, and a small group of people who sadly have one thing in common. Their initial aim is to help each other and those in similar circumstances. As their work gets underway, Andrew Garforth's highly anticipated trial falls just weeks after and uncovers further evidence towards his guilt. As it turns out, we had some really, really good evidence. Palm prints on the um, inner mudguard, in, inner guard, in the boot. I was able to interpret that, which had the child in the car. Was able to reveal finger marks underneath, on the underside of the boot lid. And you could see where these hands were scraping on the underside of the boot lid. The shoe prints in the mud matched to Ebony's shoes. His shoe prints that we got off him on the day. He had, there was a blonde hair, there was blonde hairs in the boot. And he was wearing a, a woolen jumper. He had a, a grey woolen jumper. There was a, one of her hairs on that, or a couple actually, on that jumper. There was a strand of wool from his jumper on a branch at the dam. There was DNA evidence that we obtained from Ebony's body. All of this extra detail is hugely compelling and weighs heavily in favour of the prosecution. But Garforth himself makes no attempt to plead his innocence. We didn't need to use all that because he pleaded guilty straight up, pretty much straight away. He pleaded guilty straight up and he was um, given life um, in jail. Eleven months after her murder, Ebony Simpson's killer is handed a sentence that will see him die in jail. Garfield said to his wife, I'll see you in 14 years. I thought over my dead body. The fact remains that Ebony Simpson uh, got the death sentence, the Simpson family's got the life sentence, and Garforth's got bed and breakfast. He knew the system. He'd been in the system all his life. He knew he'd, he'd probably get 14 and be out in eight. So that's how confident he was that he'd played the system over the years. I think people need to understand a lot of this uh, because it's the people who can change the system. Garforth is familiar with the law, having previous convictions in other parts of Australia for minor crimes. This time, his sentence will match the severity of his crime. He was one of the very first people in New South Wales to get life meaning life. In the past, life had meant 20 years or so, but here uh, he was one of the first, first ever in New South Wales to, to get the, the um, uh, newly legislated life meaning life, and without a shadow of a doubt, and there was not one person in New South Wales, I suggest, that thought he, he wasn't deserving of it. Garforth will spend the rest of his days behind bars for snatching Ebony from a roadside and killing her in cold blood. 
I think they think when you go to court and come out and then you just get on with your life. Well, it's not like that, you know? There seems to be... Uh, it's... There seems to be a lot of rehabilitation for the perpetrators of crime, but there's no rehabilitation for the victims. In response to her experience, Christine channels her energy into making major changes for victims of crime with a support group. Well, I think I, I took all my anger and turned it into something positive and set up Ebony House, first recovery centre in the world for homicide victims. So I burnt up all my angry energy in the positive, you know, and um, I didn't know what else to do with it. Made a lot of changes and very powerful back then. As a tribute to Christine's daughter, in December 1995, Ebony House is opened for anyone affected by the murder of a loved one, as a place to be able to grieve in private. The support group also goes on to make historic changes. Police have been taught now at the academy by the Homicide Victim Support Group and other folk how to best respond to families, what to say, what not to do, you know, correct procedures. Now, that was a real change. Police are very involved and intertwined from the outset with, with the families and providing them information, updates, uh, details as well, without compromising the investigation as well, without giving stuff away. We've had um, uh, sentencing submissions and, and victims' impact statements uh, have made a huge difference as well for families because they feel as though they can be listened to and explain in very personal terms what the murder has meant to them. I don't think you can make great changes if you haven't felt the pain. It's the pain that drives you. You can feel empathy and try to understand, but you can't, you can't feel that power of that wanting change unless it's happened to you. As the Simpson family has tried to continue with their lives, Garforth has contributed to their ongoing pain since his conviction. He claims he was bashed in jail, uh, and at one stage he claimed to have lost hearing in one of his ears, and he actually, uh, in many people's eyes, had the cheek tenacity to apply for victims' compensation. Initially, he was successful in one of those claims. I think, fortunately, it was reviewed and overturned, and then the money was uh, offered to charity. He crossed the lines of what is, what's acceptable with society, you know, and when you cross those lines, and they're precious lines with children, you can't come back into society. You've already isolated yourself. You're not worthy of living in, in here, around children or women or anything else, you know? So keep him where he is. It's the safest place for him, trust me. The counselling for Christine and her family was to span many years, and the effort channeled into the victim support group brought about many milestones and legal changes throughout Australia, one of which guarantees that Garforth has no further rights to appeal his sentence. We changed a lot of things, and, and uh, that was good. Um, but as I've got older, 20-odd years down the track, I have to say, the pain's still the same. I'm happy with what's been done, uh, but... Um, I've learned to put it somewhere, and... Um, I have built a nice life. No matter what you do in your life. And I've... I've um, put my life back together, I think, pretty well. But there's a part of my heart that's broken and I can't fix it. You know? And uh, it doesn't matter how many years go by or how much I talk about it, I can't fix it. And I'm angry about it, you know? I'm angry about what happened to my daughter. I don't want to have people tell me that I shouldn't be angry. 
I damn well should be angry. A man took my daughter's life and ruined our family. I'm angry, all right, you know. And uh, it's just this stupid system we got out there that says you're supposed to forgive and not be angry. I, I find it abs absurd, you know. I mean, if I wasn't angry and upset, uh, I wouldn't be a mother, would I? Put Ebony behind you and move on with your life. No, I'll take her with me and move on with my life. I have no forgiveness whatsoever for what that man did to her. And you can move on. You don't have to forgive to move on. I can see Ebony as plain as anything. She's still nine. I can see her hair. I can see everything about her. I can hear a voice. And no, I can't forgive a person who took that away from our family. Mm -hmm.